You guys, we have arrived at the last set of new information that you need to absorb in unit three. So we're going to pick up with that last little bit of cellular respiration and um, some two processes of fermentation that probably you have been introduced to already in freshman biology. So let's all right, starting with oxidative phosphorylation, that last step in cellular respiration. We ended off last time after the Krebs cycle. So let's uh, take stock of where we are. We made a little bit of ATP from substrate level phosphorylation. Remember, that is the version of making ATP where we have an enzyme that whose job it is to put an inorganic phosphate onto ADP, making some ATP. So we have a little bit from that. And we also made quite a bit of NADH and FADH2. So these guys, remember, are carrying some protons, some hydrogen ions, but also, very importantly, they are coming with some electrons that we are going to harness for this next process. And remember, we also released all of our carbon in the form of carbon dioxide. So that has been released to the atmosphere um, through stomata or, if you're us, through, you know, breathing out, etc., we're still in the mitochondrion, but um, let's look at some of the structures we're going to be using this time. So we kind of left off in the matrix. That's where the Krebs cycle is happening. And for this part, we are going to exploit all this surface area. Remember, we have a double membrane, and that inner membrane has infoldings called cristae. And the reason it has that is because that allows the mitochondrion to have more membrane. And the reason we want more membrane is because we are going to be doing oxidative phosphorylation using proteins embedded in the membrane, and also exploiting the compartmentalization that comes from being able to separate spaces, the inter intermembrane space from the membrane. So what you're going to notice as we go through, and I'll say this more than once, is that uh, this process is very similar to what we did in the light reaction. So you might remember how we used that separation of space between the stroma and the lumen of the thylakoid to um, power ATP synthase. We're going to be doing that same thing, but in this time, the spaces that we're going to separate are the intermembrane space and the matrix. So that's why we need a bunch of membrane. Okay, so what are we going to do? Again, this is very similar to um, what happened in the light reactions. We are going to be using those electrons carried in on NADH and FADH2 to power an electron transport chain, create a gradient, and then use that gradient to power ATP synthase. So let me kind of walk you through and then I will summarize again when we look at a picture. Okay. So in the light reactions, we got energy from the sun and used that to boost an electron that was originally from the splitting of water. We need an electron to drive an electron transport chain, right? In this case, instead, we're getting the electrons from NADH and FADH2, okay? So we're starting off with these guys, like basically dropping off their electrons those electrons are going to move down a series of proteins. So this is going to be, again, a series of redox reactions. You don't need to know what those are. You don't even need to know, like, the intermediary, like, proteins involved. You just need to know that after the electrons um, are left off by NADH and FADH2, they are going to travel down this electron transport chain. Once again, the energy of that is going to be used to create a proton gradient. So we're going to be pumping protons, uh, hydrogen ions, into the intermembrane space using this energy, okay? And uh, of course, because they're losing their electrons and along with their electrons, those protons, NADH and FADH2 are being oxidized. Remember, lose electrons oxidation they are going to be converted to NAD and FAD. So let's look at a picture and I'll say a summary of this again. All right, looking at this picture, notice that this time we're getting the electrons from NADH and FADH2. They are entering this electron transport chain and you can see that dotted red line is showing their, the path through these proteins. 
the uh, energy from those electrons is being used to pump protons into the intermembrane space from the matrix. And here is something that I didn't put on your note sheet, but I do want you to think about, and that is the transformation of energy here. We are taking kinetic energy, essentially, this movement energy of the electron, and transforming it into potential energy. When we pump the protons into the intermembrane space, it's almost like 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 filling a water balloon with water, right? Like we're 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 building up this concentration gradient that we will later transform again into kinetic energy as those protons move through ATP synthase and power ATP synthase. So it's almost like another maybe another analogy we could think about is as we pump protons into the intermembrane space or into the lumen of the thylakoid, same thing. We are, it's like lifting a rock higher and higher above our heads, right? And then later we can, that's potential energy where, you know, as we lift it higher and higher, where it's gaining more and more potential energy. And as we later drop it, then that potential energy is getting converted into kinetic or movement energy as the rock falls down. Same thing. We're building up potential energy by pumping those protons into the intermembrane space. And then that's going to be transformed again into kinetic energy. As you can see on the right here, those protons are flowing through ATP synthase and used to convert ADP into ATP. Okay, so what happens after the electron transport chain? We have pumped, um, just another picture showing how we've pumped protons into the intermembrane space. In this case, the electron is going to land on oxygen. In the light reactions of photosynthesis, NADP plus was the terminal, quote unquote, terminal electron acceptor, sort of the place where the, the electrons would ultimately land after everything. In this case, the terminal electron acceptor is oxygen. Oxygen is going to combine with, uh, so an, I'm going to notice that there's a difference between the picture at the bottom and what I wrote on the top. So um, one oxygen atom, if you look at the picture, will combine with two hydrogen ions and two electrons. Um, but the oxygen is diatomic. It likes to hang out in a pair. So, if you, so the reality of what was really happening is that one molecule of oxygen will accept four electrons and four protons to form two water molecules. So Whichever one of those makes the most sense, sense to you is okay to remember. And if neither one of those makes sense, sense to you, then ask me about it on uh, Wednesday in class. Okay. So the, the upshot is the electron is landing on oxygen. Oxygen is combining with hydrogen and electrons to make water. Okay. So that's how, remember, one of the products of this biochemical reaction overall is water. And here is where it is. And of course, uh, ADP is being uh, phosphorylated to ATP. So I've already mentioned this a couple times, but we made that proton gradient. We're harnessing the, the potential energy of that gradient as it's transformed into kinetic energy as those protons move through ATP synthase, powering ATP synthase to make ATP from ADP. Um, things in common with the light reactions. An electron gets dropped off and boosted with energy in an electron transport chain. As it moves down the chain, that energy is used to uh, power a gradient's production, the production of this uh, hydrogen ion gradient. That gradient is then used to power ATP synthase. And we get a bunch of ATP this way, which is why cells do this. Um, out of every molecule of NADH, you can make three ATP. Every molecule of FADH2 can generate two ATP. So if you do a little math, that adds, adds up to a total of 34 under ideal conditions. So this is a, um, a lot of times you'll see a range. It'll be like 20 to 34, 32 to 34, um, because obviously conditions are not always ideal, but um, maximum 34, which is a lot. And 
that oxidized NAD and FAD can now go back into the Krebs cycle. So I like this picture because it, it shows you kind of the cycling of NAD and NADH, FAD and FADH2. The TCA cycle, by the way, is just the Krebs cycle. This is another name. Um, but just notice that these things are linked with one another, these two processes. So if one stops, the other one stops because they are each rely on, reliant on a product of the other one, right? Oxidative phosphorylation uh, requires NADH and FADH2. And the Krebs cycle requires uh, those oxidized forms, the NAD and FAD. So if you stop oxidative phosphorylation, then Krebs will stop as well. So this is an important um, byproduct that we'll use to keep the whole thing going. Okay, so let's do a quick check. Uh, cellular respiration I mentioned is aerobic. This is an oxygen requiring process. Can you say why the Krebs cycle and oxidative phosphorylation will stop if oxygen is not present? So pause for a second and think, look back in your notes. And okay, so if you mentioned that oxygen is the terminal electron, electron acceptor in oxidative phosphorylation, you are right. And here is why that matters. If oxygen is not there to accept the electron at the end of the chain, then the whole electron transport chain shuts down. Um, so that's going to stop oxidative phosphorylation. Think of it like if it's... Um, a conveyor belt, right? If we have a bunch of electrons coming down a conveyor belt and it has those electrons have nowhere to go at the end, then that's going to screw everything up, right? Same thing here. So that will stop oxidative phosphorylation. And then if oxidation phosphorylation stops, then we are no longer regenerating those oxidated NAD and FADs. And those are required for Krebs. So that's why Krebs will stop if oxidation phos oxidative phosphorylation stops and that will stop if there's no oxygen. All right, so that was the end of cellular respiration. I know that is a lot, and we are gonna move on to fermentation in a second. It's just one of those things before we go forward, you're gonna to have to practice. Me just telling it to you one time, you reading it or looking at a diagram one time, it's just not enough for this. You're gonna to have to practice, come um, ready to talk about the parts that are you know most difficult for you, et cetera. All right. So one final thing, and that's fermentation. Okay. So we just talked about how the Krebs cycle and oxidative phosphorylation would get all shut down and messed up if we don't have oxygen to accept those terminal electrons. So what do we do? Is there anything to be done um, to make some ATP if we don't have that oxygen? And in fact, there is. So in an anaerobic condition, so the word part A or an means not, so not oxygen rich environment, cells will instead perform something called fermentation. We'll talk about two types and I'll show you those reactions. And you'll notice that neither of those um, versions of fermentation generates ATP directly. We, it's useful because what it does is it regenerates NAD which can just enough to keep glycolysis going. So remember, glycolysis is a process where though you have to invest two ATP, you get out four. So it is going to make two net ATP via substrate level phosphorylation. So that is uh, a useful process to keep going if you don't have oxidative phosphorylation available to you. Two types that we'll learn about, uh, alcohol fermentation, sometimes called alcoholic fermentation, and lactic acid fermentation. And um, you probably are aware of this, but there are a bunch of really delicious foods and beverages um, that we enjoy because of fermentation. Okay, starting with alcohol fermentation, this is where instead of um, entering uh, the mitochondrion and being converted to acetyl-CoA and going into Krebs, etc. pyruvate instead is going to be reduced to an alcohol. Usually that alcohol is ethanol. You may or may not be aware that alcohol is a class of molecules. Ethanol is a type of molecule. Ethanol is the type of alcohol that people drink in like alcoholic beverages. So um, that is an important byproduct. And also unique to this kind of fermentation is that a byproduct is also 
carbon dioxide. Um, think beer. The way to remember this is beer. Obviously, you know, beer is an alcoholic beverage. Um, so alcohol being produced is no surprise, but also the bubbles, right? The bubbles will remind you that this is the one that produces carbon dioxide. Side note, also, uh, bread, the carbon dioxide byproduct of alcoholic fermentation in yeast is what causes bread to rise. And then at the bottom, um, the name of the game was, of course, regenerating NAD. So we're going to regenerate some NAD that we can use in glycolysis. And lactic acid fermentation is sort of a similar idea, but just different products. Here we can see pyruvate. Um, pyruvic acid is the same thing as pyruvate. This is being converted instead to lactic acid. Um, no carbon dioxide produced. So that is an, like a, an important clue. I don't know for sure that there's a question like this, but if you were given some experimental conditions and you know it's fermentation and you see that, for example, carbon dioxide is produced, that would tell you it's not this. It has to be alcoholic fermentation because it doesn't produce carbon dioxide. Again, we're regenerating the NAD, which was kind of the goal. Um, this type of fermentation, that's interesting. I've always, I was taught and I have taught that um, this is what causes your muscles to be sore after like you overwork them or whatever. Um, the lactic acid produced that kind of, you know, will, um, will cause that pain. But I've also recently read that it's much more complicated than that. So I will get back to you if I find anything uh, interesting. But for now, you can just think of it like this is the one that makes your muscles hurt, lactic acid. Okay, let's do a little quick check and then you can be on your way. Uh, where does that NAD plus that is produced in fermentation go? So pause and think, where does it go? That's right, it goes back into glycolysis where a couple of ATP will be produced via substrate level phosphorylation. Next up, can photosynthetic organisms perform cellular respiration? This is one kids often get wrong. Can they? The answer is yes. Yes, they do. And that is because, remember, cells can't directly use glucose in their like cellular processes. They need ATP. So it's fantastic that you can make glucose, but if you don't have a way to break it down and get a bunch of ATP out, then you're not going to be doing your other biochemical reactions. So the fact that plants, for example can, you know, grow and exist is because they also have cellular respiration available to them. And then um, bacteria. What structures do you think bacteria might use uh, to perform cellular respiration given that they don't have mitochondria? Because they can do this too. A lot of them can. It depends. Um, those that can perform uh, cellular respiration will use their inner membrane. So they have a membrane inside, like their plasma membrane, and they have the cytosol. So they use that to do their cellular respiration. Okay, well done. See you in class. Bye.